Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mary Beth Alger and I'm the Artistic Director of Ashmont Hill Chamber Music. Uh, we are grateful to Patchwork Films for giving us the opportunity to share this wonderful documentary with our community, as well as an opportunity for our first collaboration with Community Music Center of Boston. As two city arts organizations and diverse communities, we have many shared goals. The mission of Ashmont Hill Chamber Music, based in Boston's Dorchester neighborhood, is to build community through the shared experience of music. We present accessible, affordable, and intimate concerts of the very highest caliber that reflect and celebrate the diversity of our community, both on stage and in the audience. And we engage young people in programs that uplift and inspire. Similarly, Community Music Center of Boston is an arts education nonprofit founded in 1910 with a mission to transform lives by providing equitable access to excellent music education and arts experiences. Over 4,000 students participate in CMCB programs every week, and the organization is the largest external provider of arts education to the Boston public schools, supporting rigorous, relevant, and culturally responsive musical instruction for one of the most diverse school districts in the nation. On behalf of Ashmont Hill Chamber Music and Community Music Center of Boston, we are excited to host Ilmar Gavilan and Lee Colian Washington. Lee Colian Washington is the Executive Director of Community Music Center of Boston. After over 20 years as a performing bassoonist, 15 years as a music professor and 10 years as an arts administrator, Lee Colian has established himself as a leader for the next generation of arts entrepreneurs. And he has been a staunch advocate for the relevance of music as an agent for social change. And as you saw in the film, Ilmar Gavilan, born to a prominent musical family in Cuba, was a first prize winner of the Sphinx competition and is the first violinist of the acclaimed Harlem Quartet. He has had a remarkable performing career, performing for President Obama at the White House and Queen Sofia of Spain in the Royal Palace of Madrid. Alongside his accomplished classical music career, he has enjoyed the privilege of performing with jazz legends such as Chick Corea and Gary Burton. So thank you so much, Ilmar and Lee Colian for joining us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thanks for that intro. It was, uh, it was wonderful. It's always so weird to hear someone read your bio back to you. So uh, <laughs> that's always an exciting, but thank you so much. And, you know, we're really excited CMCB to be partnering with the, uh, with the Ashmont Hill Chamber Music. Uh, this is really an important moment for us as well. And so we, like you, are excited to have this first, hopefully, of many collaborations with you. I want to now welcome Ilmar. It's so Great to see you. This is a really exciting. I think for me personally, uh, Ilmar and I go way back. Uh, we were graduate students in uh, the Manhattan School of Music in the early 2000s. Uh, I remember when you won the the Sphinx competition when we were finishing up school there. And so it's it's really just so exciting to see you again, just to have watched the documentary, to see the great work that you have uh, done since we were students uh, together at the Manhattan School of Music in New York. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the project? Like, what was it like? Um, tell me about your experience. Tell me what it was like working with your brother. I'm someone who has a younger brother um, oh. and we didn't grow up together. And so it really spoke to me on a personal level. Uh, my brother's 10 years younger than me, his name is Brandon. He actually lives here in Boston. And we're just now, you know, spending more time together because the, I, when I left to go to college, he was eight. Uh, eight years old. Uh, and so we didn't really grow up together in the same way. So it was really, for me, as someone who has a brother, it was really interesting to watch the movie. So just tell me a little bit about like how you got to this project and, and what it meant for you and your brother. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, like Colin. It's super, it's super fun to reconnect with you. It, it's really, you know, just seeing a face that takes me back uh, it's always wonderful. And I'm also mutually admiring your work and everything you've done after school. 
So bravo. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and also an honor to, to be talking to you. So that, that's awesome. Um, um, I like that we have sort of parallel uh, lives with our brothers, with our respective brothers, um, because uh, it is, you know, it means you really get uh, the essence of the project and how meaningful it is. Um, you ask, how is the project like? Um, it's a little bit invasive uh, because of the nature of 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 the of the relationship with my brother and the personal emotional connection to the project. Every time you have to uh, on command uh, talk about something so dear to yourself and and so intimate, uh, it's slightly um, it's slightly invasive. Uh, what's great is that both Ken and Marsha are very sensitive about timing and about giving us space. Uh, they literally had to spend sometimes like eight hours with, in my case, and I'm sure with Aldo too in Cuba. Uh, often we had a mic and we forgot we had a mic and we're actually talking trash about them. Oh my God, here, here they go again. And, <laughs> and we're literally recording that. Like, oh my gosh, here they go, this, how do you have a mic? Like, oh no, really? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so those are one of my favorite times. Uh, I wish we have behind the scenes, uh, stuff like that. A great, great story. It's at the recording studio. We had a mic and we had not only the mics in the studio of the last scene, but a personal mic to try to catch little moments and little gasp or whatever, intimate things. Aldo didn't forgot, and guess what? He farted. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a musician's joke. So I, I hope everybody else forgive us for musicians. <laughs> we love that type of talk. <laughs> and uh, oh my gosh, it was such a comic relief because we had a, t a certain tension. As you know, like in the studio, when you record, stakes are so high and little mistakes are, you know, ruins the whole take. Sometimes your take is great, but then the engineer does something wrong. Here, the engineer or even the cameraman could do something that just we have to do it again. So stakes are really high. Like, and, and for some reason, when there is a mic presence in the studios, you know, your senses are hyper and things that normally you would just let go of here just is like the end of the world, which is not, it's just your perception is just off uh, in, in terms of minus, you know, minuscule little things. It's like too much, right? So it was a very well needed <laughs> comic relief because everybody pretended it didn't happen. So I'd walk away, wait, just walk to a private place to do his business, but he was connected. <laughs> so I hear from the big speaker from the from the studio, <laughs> and, and then I see Aldo. He's like, "Oh my God, you! They heard it too." So everybody heard it in their cans. Yeah. Through that mic, he went through all over the place. So that's one of the most. That's that's a perfect example of what I mean by you have to be careful because you're. <laughs> You're there. Uh, you know, was, uh, as, as I was watching you with, <clears throat> with your brother, uh, there were all of these moments. There's so many like beautiful artistic moments uh, inside the film that I just loved. I was love to hear you play. I love to listen to Harlem Quartet. I never heard your brother perform, so it was beautiful to be able to hear that. But then, you know, just like what you just mentioned, uh, there were these moments in which you really got to see who you were as brothers and like just the complexity of like being brothers. Uh, there's the moment in the airport where, you know, you know, you're what you're supposed to meet and you end up at home. And then there's the moment where he comes to see you at the airport. <laughs> and, and, but then there's these moments in which you're making food together where he's putting the apron on you and he's giving you a tasting the food. And so there's all these, these it, it showed um, the complexity of being brothers, but also like just the love that was, that, that also exists in being brothers. Can you tell me a little bit about, about what that was like for you to not only to go through the experience of, of making the film, but actually to watch and see that, did they really capture who you were as brothers? Uh, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, they did a phenomenal um, work. 
because they didn't sugarcoat uh, things like that mishaps in the in the at the airport. And Aldo was really mad at me. He's like, how did you, how couldn't you call me? It's like my phone doesn't work here. Well, ask anybody for a phone. It's like last time I was in Cuba, people didn't have cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so, and for me, that's just and uh, and, and so and then they did such a great edit. That's one of my favorite edits, actually, because that piece that we're playing does have these uh, stops and goes, stop and go, and it really captured like our hand gestures and our argument. It was phenomenal. I think that's bravo. I give them, I give them like many trophies for that scene. I love that scene. <laughs> and uh, in terms of the tenderness, is they capture it. You know, sometimes you know, in front of camera, you're more reserved. Um, but I think we are we have a hard time being reserved because just like you left home when, when your brother was eight, the same. Aldo was, I think, seven actually. And I left for a boarding high school. I was 14. It's a slightly different, uh, less uh, time, but the idea is the same. So your last image is of a baby brother. Even if he becomes some kind of famous genius, which he became, uh, <laughs> for me, he's still a baby brother. And I'll kiss him in the cheek and hug him and play with him and steal food from him still. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> now we just, and you know, we, uh, uh, we, we you know we did we develop uh, this awesome relationship of mutual respect, but also uh, we have our own baby talk. We're not afraid of just you know start mispronouncing words the way he did, or you know. So we have all of these codes and uh, that are brotherly codes that are so dear to us, and um, the fact that uh, that we can make music together is just. You know, it's the most amazing thing. It's beautiful. You know, you're you're your great sense of humor even now, and that actually comes through uh, from you both. But that comes through uh, from you in the uh, in the movie as well. I mean, there's just as you're watching this movie and and you're seeing everything that's happening around you, you're seeing what's happening politically around you. Um, you're you know, you're kind of seeing what's happening with the travel. You're seeing all of these things, and then I'm thinking about even now. Uh, you know, we're dealing with COVID and we're socially distanced and, and here you are showing up here with that same sense of humor. Like it, it does, it kind of doesn't matter. Can you just tell me like, how do you maintain this sense of hope inside all of these things that have been happening really throughout your entire life uh, that would be difficult for most people uh, to just to handle? And you actually seem to take it with a sense of grace and humor that really, I think, came through from, from you and your brother both. And so not only historically, how have you been able to do that, but really also how are you able to do that now with everything that's happening, especially for musicians right now? That's actually a phenomenal question. So, um, you know, something comes to mind that Winter Marsalis told me. Uh, he, he, he told me once uh, about blues and it really applies to, to what I'm trying to convey now. He said, blues is not happy. Like uh, a lot of jazz comes from pain. He said, you take the pain, you don't, you don't look away. You take it and you swing with it. Uh, so if you're happy without, without the depth and, the, and the, the fullness of the whole experience, which includes separation, pain, uh, anxiety, like what's going to happen? Like I want to be together. You take all of that, and that's who is part of who you are. So I think it's something to do with uh, with embracing uh, and not running away from who you are, but yet look at the bright side. It's a choice to look at the bright side. It's it could be a coping mechanism. I'm not like Dr. Phil or something. <laughs> it could be, but it has worked for me yeah. to yeah. to also feel extremely connected to my to my family roots. Um, so, uh, like when I'm a little bit down, I actually put uh, Cuban music on. I just want to move a little bit and feel these drums, especially Afro-Cuban music without words, just the drums, just to pick me up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's hard to 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 stay down. So I I think uh, uh, everybody have to find their own mechanisms. To me, like. Um, uh, that helps me connecting with them helps me a lot. 
um, maybe uh, just visualize the sea, you know, like I, I, now it's so cold here, we have to skip this Christmas trip to Cuba. And it, it, it does a number in my head. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually convinced that also does something physically, not only vitamin D, but just, just in the winter, if anybody, I, I advise anybody to try to skate somewhere warm, at least once, just break that winter in, in two. So we've been doing that. By the way, I think that's a big part of it, just staying connected at least once a year, uh, having this uh, like dinners together. Like we, I stay there at least two weeks when I go with my kids. So my kids play with all those kids. My dad's still alive and enjoys that company. And we, uh, we just make music, go places, go to the beach. Uh, so uh, it's a long answer to your question. Half of it is, is, is that depth that I talked about. And the other one is the practical aspect of it, of actually stay connected. And, um, and there is always an underlying uh, in my character. And I think others too, there is like a gratefulness that comes uh, uh, from no particular reason. And I think that's a really good attitude in life and it comes really handy now. It's just something, uh, perhaps it's, it's common to a lot of Cubans because when you're in an island, uh, smiling is it's actually a cultural thing. When you see somebody slightly grumpier to themselves, uh, somebody comes and bothers them. <laughs> you know, even though they, they might want their space, like, what's going on? What, do, do you need some sugar? <laughs> do you, is that right? you know, like, and if you're in a if you're in a party and you don't dance, somebody actually will grab you through the hand and make you bounce a little bit. It's just a cultural mm -hmm. thing too. So yeah. I'm trying to give you a, a round answer to your question. No, no, I, I completely understand. Uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a traditional black family. And so many of these things are very similar. I think that, you know, me and my sister, my younger, my older sister, Sandra, we talk about growing up and having like, you know, uh, ketchup sandwiches, you know, because that was what we had to eat. But, you know, for us, it's, it wasn't almost like, oh, we had ketchup. So I was like, yeah, we had ketchup, but Heinz was better than the Hunts, you know, what we were talking about, <laughs> right? I'm so, you know? I'm so glad you understand that. Yeah, for <laughs> us, that is similar. Actually, yeah. one of the songs, um, I shouldn't call it a song, one of the compositions that Aldo has in, uh, and we love with Harlem Quartet is called Pan con Timba. Mm -hmm. And that translate, translates to bread with who knows. Yeah. That's the translation, and it's kind of like your ketchup sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it's bread with an unknown substance that was found at the moment. So that's so popular, pan con timba. You cannot say in the cafeteria, actually, that's a real title in the cafeteria. Yeah. You say pan with croquette, pan mm -hmm. con timba. Timba yeah. means don't ask, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> Whatever you find inside that bread, is what you're gonna get and <laughs> no refunds i warn you <laughs> so i'm so happy you have the same i mean sad but happy <laughs> that right. well i mean again it's one of those things where i think you really do learn to uh find this sense of joy sense of humor uh in some of the things that are happening i mean because that you know to your point yeah sure it's it's a it's a coping mechanism but i also think that it really prepares people for times like now um where you know things are really challenging kind of collectively and it's you know but those of us who have experienced certain types of things it's like i was actually prepared for a little bit of this uh can't be completely compared for this sort of thing but a little bit prepared maybe more than others I want to move to some of the uh, artistic parts um, yes. of the uh, of the of the of the of the film. Um, so you're the first violinist of the Harlem Quartet, uh, which is you know amazing, and I've heard you many times in that uh, in that ensemble. Um, and the mission of that quartet is to advance diversity in classical music, engaging young and new audiences through the discovery and presentation of varied repertoire that includes works by composers of color. I like that. I really like that as a, as a mission statement. But can you tell me, tell me about the Harlem Quartet, what the work is, what it means to you, and why your work specifically as it relates to the Harlem Quartet is so important? 
That's a wonderful question also. Um, well, Harlan Quartet originated from four first prize winners from Sphinx competition. And in the inception, the very second it got uh, originated, we had a very specific mission to diversify classical music, starting by the audience. Uh, in order to do that, we couldn't expect uh, kids from Harlem uh, schools, public schools, to voluntarily and spontaneously one day uh, have this epiphany. Oh, let me take the A train and go to Carnegie Hall and spend my lunch month, <laughs> my lunch money <laughs> for the month yeah. in one ticket. It's not gonna happen. So we were very clear, very practical, and we thought, you know what? We're gonna bring Carnegie Hall to them. We're gonna bring classical music to them. So from the beginning, we embraced that um, role of being music ambassadors, and we very clear that if we don't do it for ourselves, not I mean, we we shouldn't expect uh, anybody else to do it. So we went to every single school in, in Harlem, every single one. And uh, sometimes we even repeated the schools and they already knew us by name and stuff. It was very meaningful. We spent an entire year doing that. Uh, we had an office in Harlem, paid by Sphinx, by the way. And two members actually lived there permanently because they were from out of the country. Uh, we had a member uh, from Canada, another member from uh, London. Uh, by the way, I have great stories of death. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say death. I meant to say Desmond. Uh, he's, a, he's a Jamaican uh, a man originally, but completely raised in London. So he called himself a coconut. I'm quoting him. And there was nothing better than hear him interact with the brothers from Harlem. They look at him like, what's wrong with your accent? <laughs> So we, we had all sorts of there, like, uh, can you ask them where you can catch La Traviata? And, and so <laughs> and we had theirs, you know, for him to just walk up to the corner and ask anybody, <laughs> excuse me, uh, would you indicate to me how to get to La Traviata? Just like that, and, and just to see their reactions. But what I'm trying to convey also is that we did not want to come across that way. We wanted to come across to the kids as, as natural as possible. So uh, very quickly, we learned that it wasn't enough to play standard repertoire. We needed to diversify our repertoire. So our first piece we played was Take the A Train by Duke Ellington. And we still play that piece as anchors very often because it just brings us to our origins. So we started to, um, to make a, a conversation in the kid's mind and, in, and actual connections. Like, so what does uh, Duke Ellington, this, this piece you just play and this minuet have in, in common, let's say, so nothing. So, well, no, they have a beat in common. And, uh, and uh, actually, you know what? This piece, it, the swing, it's a dance. Uh, very famous in New Orleans, and a minuet is a dance that was very famous in Vienna, in palaces. And then we go on sideways into, into history and start talking about Vienna, weeks, uh, carnival um, in uh, New Orleans, weeks, customs. Mm -hmm. And we start making these connections and kids all of the sudden, rather than being passive listeners or somebody with their hands behind their back in a museum, just be bored, don't touch, it's not related to me, it's like a thousand years old. No, instead of that, we gave them permission to raise their hands, ask questions. We started doing very short uh, tasters of, of, of movements instead of the whole movement. We learned this amazing skill, which uh, we like to pass on, of uh, just stopping on the spot. If, if we lose them, we make a little cadence, no, no matter where we are in the piece, we make a little cadence, and acknowledge that we lost the kids and, and just engage them right away. Um, so that is one of the most brilliant uh, trainings that you and I did not get at Manhattan School of Music because you have to deal with this type of outreach concerts, this type of specific audiences that has, are not used to classical music to learn the skill uh, of, of engaging and being uh, simple yet uh, eloquent because you know they can't tell if you're just making up stuff 
you need to still have your chops and 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 also when you speak you have to be uh you, you need to make connections that are real you cannot just make up stuff uh so uh that combination of uh just being educated and yet being able to uh, transfer that knowledge in a way that can be received mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 a skill that we we just took to these days and uh i just want to quickly mention i this is it's a long answer for your question, but no, uh, thanks to this um, diverse repertoire and trying to reach out to these kids uh, through through non-standard music like jazz and some Latin tunes as well, our our style became also diverse, and the, the way that we play uh, arrangements became very uh, attractive to great jazz players like our uh, recently deceased legend, Chick Corea, um, and, and Gary Barton. Gary Barton is still with us, but anyhow. Um, so these people start hearing about us and start calling us because they hear that the sound is the right sound, even though it's string instruments. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than an opera singer trying to do blues, but they still have that vibrato, like La Traviata trying to do pop singer, it doesn't work. So we have to, uh, uh modify our playing to respect the style just like when you play Mozart you don't attempt to do glees like like you're playing gypsy music right it's the same thing when you play jazz you don't do you don't do the Brahms sound you don't sustain <laughs> you don't vibrate you don't do that and but a lot of classical musicians look at jazz like an anchor type thing like a lesser like if that's something you give us dessert. And by doing that, you're just boxing that type of music, which happens to be American music by majority uh, black composers. You're boxing that as the dessert type music. And we always wanted to make a point that it's not, it's not that at all. It has its own language, its own complexity. So we even place that type of music inside the program. We don't save it to the end because we don't want to give the mixed message. And uh, so that's become, uh, that has become our like living mission, uh, not just with words, but you can see it in the programming and who we try to, to play, what, what type of composers and uh, always uh, American composers are Amer the composers that today they call it uh, underrepresented. We always thought they're just our type of composers. <laughs> underrepresented for you, not for yeah. me. I mean, they are really there. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm, I'm happy that the industry is cashing up. I'm not discounting that. I'm, I'm bravo. Good, good. But that's what we've been doing for the last 14 years. You know, I'm you that this is you make me wonder. Maybe we did learn some similar things about community engagement and community based work at, at the Manhattan School. We were, you know, because we're so we're so aligned in 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 that thinking. Actually, when I was at MSM, I was in the they had I was in the orchestral performance program, uh, the OP program, and um, we had an outreach uh, woodwind quintet. And it was like part of my part of my scholarship there was to go into schools with this quintet and like play concerts and we actually did get some training they we worked with an acting coach to learn how to move around the space. It was actually it was actually kind of cool so I want to I want to give MSM a shout out for uh, for it's having I'm, I'm it was taking orchestral performance and this is you know again this is the late 90s early 2000s you know this is when outreach performances were really starting to become more of a thing outside of the just like having the orchestra tour and going to elementary schools but having small groups do that work as well and so we were being trained to do that but I think that something that you are talking about uh, and, I, and as I was watching the the movie I was really thinking about this new vision that the Community Music Center of Boston has. One of the things that we just recently, uh, and people will be hearing more about it soon, but uh, we're really thinking about becoming a more a culturally inclusive organization overall. Um, and so really trying to understand what it means, uh, what does culture mean, and what does it mean to then be culturally inclusive? Um, and I know that uh, Ashmont Hill Chamber Music, they're doing some of the same things in my conversations with Mary Beth. If you look at the, if you look at just their series for the year, 
it's beautiful, like the, the people that they bring in, the types of music that they share with their audiences. So we're really, in many ways, kindred spirits as it relates to this idea of being uh, culturally inclusive. And when I was watching the documentary where you're seeing so much that is you know, connected to Cuba, connected to African rhythms, connected to just Latin music, connected to America. There are all these various cultures that are shown. You're watching your family have dinner and you're doing Latin rhythms, and, you know, right? You know, at the, at the dinner table, you know, there's so much in there. Can you just tell me from your perspective, while the rest of us are continuing to try to define this culturally inclusive and what it means, can you give me a sense of what it means to you yeah. to be culturally inclusive, sp specifically as it relates to your art. Absolutely. First, let me just uh, give a shout out to MSM, Manhattan School of Music. I did not know that you have that type of training and I applaud that. Mm -hmm. That's just wonderful because yeah. I, I did learn that in, the, in, in Harlem schools. Yeah. So bravo for that. And I wish I had acting skills. <laughs> sometimes these kids annoy me so much and I had to act, but without the skill. Like, <laughs> wait for your tongue to speak. We're playing now. <laughs> you try to finish a phrase and they're, they're already telling you, you know, my aunt has a guitar. You're like, we're still playing. I'm not, it's not even question time. So I, I wish I had you to I have to say one thing. I have to say, this is my favorite. Before I have to say this one, this is my favorite story. We were playing this, we were playing some con. we were playing a concert. And it was in the middle of one of the movements. And so someone says, one of my colleagues in the quintet, he says, uh, does anyone have any questions? And then one of the kids raises their hand and the kid says, my dad has a French horn. <laughs> and so then my, then my colleague, he says, okay, does everyone here know what a question is? <laughs> I just never forgot that. I was always loved it, so I apologize. I just had to tell that story. So much. please tell it. I feel like I'm not alone, and I'm not going crazy. They but tell me, what is it, what, as you think about your art, what does it mean to be culturally inclusive? What does that mean to you? I think, um, first of all, um, is finding real connections. By real, I mean uh, because sometimes I feel. Uh, that because of, of that uh, posture of being inclusive, we, we try to tie things that are not really tied. Like let's say, let's say um, you want to be inclusive and you put a mariachi band uh, in, let's say, uh, Miami, where most people are Cuban, Venezuelans, and it's like, <laughs> I know you're trying hard, but that's not <laughs> really, <laughs> that's not really working. Or, or like, let's say you're in California and it's vastly a Mexican community and you be, want to be inclusive and you bring Afro-Cuban brothers with drums and do what they do. They're like, that, that's fascinating. I don't know how that relates to me, but that's great. So you need to find connections that are real. So I think we have to look in our community that we're trying to do that and not just go by some guidelines that don't really apply to you. Uh, uh, so like, let's say you are, I think you get my point. Uh, I do. Uh, so for me, for instance, there is a slight disconnect uh, when it comes to, to what it is to be Pan-African. Uh, you and I had a wonderful leader, Robert Smith from Manhattan School of Music. He organized Pan-African concerts mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. people from African descent from anywhere would play together. And I was very happy that finally I felt included because, uh, yes, I am Latino. Of course, I'm Latino. But guess what? I'm also African because, you know, literally my blood descends from African slaves, just like the American slave or the Dominican slave or the Jamaicans. So that idea of Pan-African, like our first cellist, Desmond, he was Jamaican from London. So guess what? That's Pan-African. So those are real connections. You're not just making them up. So um, when, when, you, when you start feeling and, and actually seeing these common threads and you, you facilitate the understanding of these threads, I think that's what inclusion is. 
Mm -hmm. uh, not when you shove up my throat something that, uh, okay, that it's not really working. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's just not the way it works. You have to facilitate you yourself realizing these connections. And um, I think, uh, I think the government cannot do that. I think us as musicians, as artists, we can actually tell because we uh, just by studying music as serious as we have, we have a, a great deal of uh, history, historical context, how this music mm -hmm. traveled from here to here. Um, we, we, you know, we don't try to, but we know geography, we know history, and we know what connects people. And we understand dances. It's a human instinct to dance. So if we do these largest things that really connect people, um, I think we're very successful. Um, with that said, we have to take in account what community it, it is that live around us and we want to attract to, let's say, concert halls, a little more specifically classical music uh, audiences. Well, yes, it helps to put music that resonates with their uh, most natural uh, cultural um, like influences. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you put, um, let's say, Lecuona, this old La Malagueña, this old Cuban composer, is all enough to have wide enough uh, roots to attract Latinos from all over. It doesn't have to be Cuban. Right. But uh, uh, things like that, right? you need to program things that, uh, that speaks to, to the parents of the kids that eventually you want to start coming. Yeah, no, I think you, I think you, I think you answered that really well. I think that it, what you're saying, what I'm hearing is you have to be willing to do the work. Uh, you can't, you know, I, I'm here we are, it's February, it's Black History Month, right? And some places, you know, like the only time they're going to program any Black musicians or any Black composers is this month, right? This is it. And then they're like, well, Done with black people. So, <laughs> woo, I'm glad that <laughs> the shortest one, you know, right? Yeah. You know, and, and without actually recognizing, and this is something that we say, you know, all skin folk ain't kin folk, right? All black people aren't the same. Someone from someone who's Cape Verdean and someone who's Haitian is very different, maybe culturally, than someone who is, you know, a black African American, right? And so, like, being in what you describe in Latin community as well, like, you can't. You know, Puerto Ricans are very different than Mexicans, right? <laughs> you know, so like, you know, trying to conflate those as, as one monolith is not being culturally inclusive. You have to recognize the nuance in all of them and recognizing the nuance. Actually, I learned a lot just listening to you talk about it. Recognizing the nuance is the work. Like that is what it means to be culturally inclusive. The attempt to be culturally inclusive is being tokenistic right being a token we we put one we put we put a latin group in this mariachi band in miami so we we did what we're supposed to do right we're we're good right <laughs> like to me that is and i agree with you to me that's just um it's not poorly intentioned it's just lazy right it's just really lazy um no it's for the long for the longest time uh, in in hollywood they will finish any any Latin scene with ole. That's like a Spanish flamenco thing. Right. Uh, or, or, or they can just throw caramba, that's a Mexican saying, in any other scene of anything, it could be tango. So yeah. that is not just us, it's just, um, and you know, to me, it's not really like a, I'm not scolding the culture because I, I think I understand. It's like, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a big deal. As long as, what you said, we're willing to see the nuances, but more importantly, I think the common threads, yeah. because yeah. mariachi might not be a common thread, but fine. But there are all the things that are a common thread, and if you talk about those things, people respond. Right. So when you when you throw a wide enough net, and you acknowledge the nuances, I think that's what cultural uh, um, sensitive it is. That, that's what it is. I got a couple other questions for you. Uh, my first one is, this has been great. It's been great to, again, you know, to, to, to trade fours with you a little bit. You know, this has been great. Um, can you tell, what are some things you're working on right now? Uh, some things that are coming up for you? We, 
we want to introduce our audiences to you and to like what's happening in your career and how can they stay in touch with you. So, you know, there's some things coming up that you would like to share with our audience um, or there's some ways in which we can keep up with you. Do you mind sharing us a little bit about just what's going on with you and with the Harlem Quartet and your brother? Uh, also someone we'd love to introduce our audiences to and what, you know, if there are things and ways we can engage with him, that would be great. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to maybe um, share some of the websites that are, you know, the, the easiest way to stay in touch. My brother has his own. Um, Harlan Quartet has his own. Um, and projects that are really cool coming up. Uh, we're playing with Anthony McKeel. Um, we started rehearsing next week. Um, and March 9th, we will be doing a virtual concert uh, for uh, Center College. And the piece is a great piece called Shotgun um, by Valerie, the, the uh, flutist from Imani Quartet. Who is, oh, no. if, yeah, she's, a, she's now a, a full-time composer. Of course, she's still a great uh, flutist that doesn't go anywhere. But uh, she wrote this piece based on a fight, uh, that, uh, a very famous fight with Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and uh, because uh, they're from, you know, he's from, from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, the Center College from Kentucky wanted mm -hmm. to support this, this effort. So uh, we are extra excited. Um, we recorded that piece with David Schifrin already and it, it has great accolades. So it's not a premiere, but it would be cool to play with Anthony. And anytime the quartet has a guest, uh, we're really, really excited. And uh, especially Anthony is a great guest to have. We, we played with him uh, too long ago. So it, it, was, it was time. And as I was going to share the audience, uh, Anthony McGill is the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic. Uh, he is one of the world's great, great clarinet players. Just to make sure our audiences know who Anthony, because some people I would maybe don't know who Anthony McGill is. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. And, and my kids uh, just remember, that clarinet is that play in Obama's inauguration, <laughs> side to side with Yo-Yo Ma, it's Zach Perman, and uh, a great pianist. Escape my, my name now. Yeah. Um, but anyways, that that guy. So he's, yeah. um, and also, you know, playing something that is programmatic, like obviously programmatic. I think all music is programmatic. We just have to do the plot in our head and communicate it well to the audience. But this music is like, explicitly programmatic. Some of the accents match punches and she, she let us know this is when he got knocked out. Yeah. And there is like a fight with the Russian guy and the, the music turns a little bit rusky at that point and pa, pa, the, the hits and stuff. So it, it's really exciting and, and it's a great pr uh, product for, for outreach too. I mean, it's not easy music, but the whole story and the whole visual imagery it's very exciting. So that's March 9th, yeah. 730. Uh, we are connected somehow. We, you know, uh, it would be obvious where to log in to see that concert coming that's up. That's great. Thank you. My last question is one of the things we've been talking about here at CMCB and some of the things I'm really seeing with Ashmont Hill uh, Chamber of Music as well uh, is just giving people hope. Uh, you know, just really the idea of giving people hope in this time. That's what people need and that's what the world needs from us. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could just close us out with uh, just to something, give us a little bit of hope about the future, either of the world um, or of our artistic genre or of music. It'd be great if you could just give us something, give us a hopeful message uh, to, to, to go away with. Well, I honestly see the light um... And at the end of the tunnel, when it comes to when it comes to performing again, uh, besides all of the wonderful things that will happen uh, with the vaccine, I think the industry adapted um, to hybrid type performances. The point is that we are performing again, uh, even if the if the concert halls are not filled to capacity, and um, we we will have measures for a long time. It's not going to go away. But the fact that um, we were forced to do virtual um, concerts and collaborations actually connected a lot of people even more mm -hmm. from around the world. Like, um, I'm not a big fan of the Leader Square concerts, but guess what? It's a great, 
it's a great way to connect and these connections are made and they will come to fruition in person when the moment comes and if the moment will come mm -hmm. so what i'm trying to say is this is the moment where a lot of artistic ideas and and projects are being uh, are seen are being uh, prepared for for a large spring a cultural spring and um and uh, i do think that in a, in a really strange way, humanity connected uh, more. We simply, you know, when we're experiencing the same thing, no matter if you're a third world country or you're a super developed country, we're, you know, we're experiencing very similar things. And uh, the fact that we acknowledge the commonality and the fragility of humankind also makes us acknowledge our higher self as people and ways to connect that, uh, are definitely um, will prepare us forward. And um, that was a very strange message of hope, but I do, this is my no. hope. That, no, uh, yeah. no, it's beautiful. Just the idea that we are, we're, we're finally learning how to connect through distance. Um, you know, I think that's, I think that's a beautiful message. And I'm, and, and now we're finally, we're, we have this desire to connect again because of this forced distancing. I think that's, I think that's beautiful. Uh, so thank you, thank you really. Thanks, thank you Ilmar for, sh for sharing that. My pleasure, Legolian. Thanks so much for having this. It was a lot of fun. Same, <laughs> same, same. I'd like to welcome back Mary Beth. Thank you, thank you. That was such a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it. I, I have to say I've had a number of great laughs over the course of it. It was really, um, and, and not to mention, extremely um, informative and inspirational. So uh, thank you for the great conversation and for your time, both of you. And thanks to our audience for joining us. And we look forward to more events together. Uh, thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>